Back in 1964, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King was giving a speech, and in that speech he made the, the comment that Sunday morning at 11 o'clock is the most racially segregated hour in America. The hour when the nation all files into their churches uh, is when people would most likely be surrounded by people only of their own cultural group. That was 55 years ago, and sociologists were very quickly able to analyze the data and determine that what he was saying was absolutely true. Um, and, but the sad and, and maybe not so shocking reality is that in 2019, things haven't really changed that much. This kind of thing doesn't just happen in America, it happens everywhere. People prefer to be with their own kind, and when a consumerist attitude pervades the church, um, an attitude that makes it all about you know, what we can get out of it, what is our experience, and the, and the sec- success of, uh, or failure of a church is based on what kinds of you know, feelings we can generate, um, then of course... We're going to congregate with the people that we think are our own, our people. The reason why things haven't changed is due in large part to something called the church growth movement that began in the 70s that told churches to do exactly this thing. And and their premise was this. uh, Premise uh, number one, we want to save as many people as possible. Number two, it's hard to make people comfortable with people that are, that are different, that aren't like them. If, if you try to bring people together across cultural lines, economic classes, or generations, uh, or even different personal interests, you're, you're sowing the seeds of conflict. And we want church to be a nice experience, right? So number three, if we want to, the church to grow, we need, need to make this easier for people. We need to make church a nice experience. Number four, therefore, churches need to be planted that appeal to homogeneous units. And so all over the world, churches were planted or they shifted gears so that people don't have to be with others that are different from themselves. Believe it or not, this began in India uh, where a missionary named Donald McGavran was trying to plant churches among former Hindus, and uh, when you try to take people from all different castes, different classifications of, of society, try to bring them all together, the resentments run too deep. The mistrust is so great that this tr- these churches don't grow. They're, they're just rife with conflict. It's hard. And so he gave up. And he said, we're going to plant a church for this caste and a different church for that caste and a different church for that caste where people can be with people they're comfortable with. And this worked. Churches grew. He had the data. He had the research to prove that this worked. He called this the homogeneous unit principle. And this model spread around the world because churches wanted something that worked. Is there anyone here uh, who's visiting from Abbotsford? Good, because I can trash on Abbotsford a little bit. That's where I'm from. And so when I say trash, I mean mean with love. Um, So Abbotsford has 95 churches. Last time they, they counted. There's probably more now. So that's about one church for every, every 1,400 people. Um, why are there so many churches? It's not just that there are different denominations. Okay, There are different denominations. There's not 95 of them. It's not just that in some cases people speak different languages. Obviously, it's important to be able to communicate and to hear the words. So yes, you, having different churches you know, operate in different languages, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but part of the reason why there are 95 churches in the town where I grew up is because of this homogeneous unit principle. So, you know, back in the late 70s, early 80s, these churches, they started to gear towards target groups, people that they wanted to attract, you know? 
And so, you know, as I was growing up there, you know, you had the Gen X church, right? Which is going to reach a certain generational group that dresses a certain way, listens to a certain kind of music. You know, you've got the pastor with the tattoos and, the, and bonus marks for dreadlocks, right? But then you also have the, the very kind of white bread middle class church where it's like golf shirts and khakis are mandatory. And then you have one church that's like, you know what? All we're doing is seniors, right? So we don't need to worry about drums, don't need to worry about electric guitars, just hymns, and we, we can all be comfortable with people that are like us. And then you have also ethnic churches, which exist not because of the languages, they still speak English, but they just want to be people with people like themselves, and everybody then, then the burden uh, is, is shifted to the, the churchgoer as a consumer to find the place where they fit. You know, shop around and find where you fit. Where are you most at home? And so 11 o'clock on Sunday morning in Abbotsford is the time when we who all work together with people of different races and different ethnicities and cultures, that's when we are the most segregated there too. So what's wrong with this? What is wrong with tailoring our music or our message or our programs or even our staffing choices to appeal to certain groups? I mean, Jesus came to save people, right? 2 Peter 3.9, he does not wish for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Now, we can't please everybody, right? What's wrong with organizing ourselves into these homogeneous silos? of people that we're comfortable with. I mean, after all, Paul said he was ready to use any and all means at his disposal to to win people to Jesus. He says, I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. So why shouldn't Sunday morning at at 11 a.m. be segregated? Where in Scripture does it say that this is wrong? Well, we're going to start, today we're just going to look at Galatians 2, the passage that Steve read for us a few minutes ago, and we're going to look at how this this issue of segregating, of separating from different groups, it it came up in Peter's ministry, and we're going to look at how Paul addressed it. Um, We're going to talk about the the twin issues here of racism and legalism, uh, because these are the immediate issues that Paul is confronting in this passage. But we're also going to talk about a few other issues um, that might seem a little out of place here, because there is a deeper issue at stake here in this passage that I, I want to unpack. Um, so just so you know, we're not just going to be talking about circumcision this morning. There is more to it than that. So but what, what is the problem here that, that Paul is tackling Up until this point in the book of Galatians, Paul, he's been contending for the gospel against a group of very influential leaders that were in the early church in the Roman province of Galatia, who've been saying that in order to be saved, in order to be right with God, you have to follow the laws of the Torah. This group tried to undermine Paul's influence and his authority by saying that that Paul didn't really represent the genuine teaching of Jesus. He didn't really represent the rest of the apostles. And, and this group wanted every Gentile male who had come to Christ to be circumcised, as, as, as this would prove that they are definitively under the law of Moses. In, in effect, what they are teaching is that in order to be acceptable in the eyes of God, you have to become culturally Jewish. You have to be assimilated. But the apostles we read last week, they didn't actually teach that. They didn't actually believe that. What they said and what Paul was saying were the same things. A person does not have to become Jewish in order to become a member of God's family. Now we come to verse 11. And Paul tells us about an incident where he had to confront Peter to his face over this issue. 
And, and, and he tells us the reason in verse 12. He says, when he first arrived, when Peter first arrived, he ate with Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But afterwards, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. And as a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. And even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. In other words, what happened here is Peter Peter started to refuse to eat with Gentiles, and so did many other Jewish believers. And, And it all goes back to the fact that for their whole lives, they have been taught that good Jews don't do this. Good Jews don't eat with Gentiles. See, under the, under the Mosaic law, Gentiles themselves were unclean. And the food that they ate was unclean. The whole ceremonial law in the Old Testament, everything to do with sacrifice and, and cleanness laws, had to do with pointing people to the reality that in order to, be, to have a relationship with God, to be at peace with God, to be fit to stand in the presence of God, sinners have to be cleansed. And for, for Peter and Barnabas and the other Jewish believers, they, they forgot. Or they at least didn't live in the reality of the fact that Jesus makes people clean. And they went this path of, of separation. They didn't want anyone to see that they were in, in any kind of unity with this other group, these Gentiles, right? Why is Paul so upset about this? Because this is, as he calls it, hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy. And and there are two dimensions to this hypocrisy. There's a vertical dimension having to do with, you know, how we understand our relationship with God. There's also a horizontal dimension, like how we understand our relationship with one another. And, and the vertical relationship, it, it just it, it reveals a very twisted way of understanding our relationship with God. If you believe that Jesus really makes a person clean in the eyes of God, you can't insist that the law is necessary to make us clean at the same time. It's either one or the other. These things are, are mutually exclusive. And so... Paul tells Peter to his face, listen, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you trying to make these Gentiles follow Jewish traditions? You and I are both Jews by birth, not sinners like these Gentiles. You know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ and not because we've obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. So he's explaining here that the vertical dimension of the problem, this is totally distorting the, how God has saved us, right? It makes it a matter of a person's performance instead of the love and the grace of God. And this is this is legalism. This is this is what it is. Now, I, d- I do just want to take a minute to talk a little bit more about this this word legalism. Um, it's an interesting word. It's interesting how people use it. In my experience, this is a word um, that is that is very convenient and and very readily reached for whenever a person is confronted about their sin. And I know that if I tell someone, listen, as as a follower of Jesus, um, you know, you shouldn't be sleeping with your boyfriend or you shouldn't be sleeping with your girlfriend until you're married. Um, Or it would really be good for you to be involved in a church and not just sit at home on Sunday morning watching, you know, videos on YouTube. Or if I say, hey, you know, <laughs> you really need to watch your, your drinking habits and stuff like that. I fully expect that 99 times out of 100, the words legalist and Pharisee are going to be dropped. As if somehow that's just like shutting down any argument, right? 
See, when, when you have the responsibility of, of shepherding people and, and people are caught by their own sin and they're caught in their sin's capacity to try and hide itself, the label of, of legalist and Pharisee is a very convenient one to use to deflect, right? Um, but what is then legalism really if it's not just being held accountable? A guy called J. Gresham Machen wrote a commentary on Galatians and, and he gave a really good explanation of it this way. The central point at issue is the order of these three steps. The legalist says, believe in Jesus Christ. Second, keep the law. And then if you do this, third, you will be saved. The gospel, on the other hand, says, first, believe in Jesus Christ. And second, at that moment, you are saved. And then third, the natural outgrowth of this, of, of, of recognizing God's love for you and becoming the child of God that you were made to be, is that you will follow his law. You'll want to. See, in, in both legalism and the gospel, the result should be that a person obeys God. But as far as the motivation goes, as far as the, the way that we relate to God, it, is told, it couldn't be more different. You know, a legalist does, does what he does out of fear, right? He's got to be climbing that ladder. He's got to be waking up every day feeling like he's on a knife edge because if he fails, the consequences are, are pretty dramatic. A legalist is also selfish because the reason why they do what they do is to save themselves. You know, they're doing good works, not, not for any other reason, but they, they, this is how they advance in the eyes of God. Someone living under grace, someone who believes the gospel, they have a totally different motivation. They're not acting out of fear. They're responding out of love. And they do what they do as an act of worship. So that's, that, that's, that really is the heart of legalism there. And, and this is why Peter, Paul calls Peter out. Because his actions were those of a legalist. He behaved as if a person had to follow the law in order to be saved. That's the vertical dimension but there's a horizontal dimension to this as well. The gospel brings us peace with God, but it, not only peace with God, it brings us peace with one another. And this peace isn't just not being hostile, it's a kind of peace that actually makes us family. It makes us one with each other across lines of ethnicity and culture so that we should be able to worship together, we should be able to serve together, we should be able to eat meals together. We shouldn't be separate. Paul explains this in his letter to the Ephesians. He says, For Christ himself has brought us peace. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandment and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility toward each other was put to death. Jesus has made us one. And when we refuse to fellowship with one another, when we refuse to worship together, when we refuse to serve together and eat together, we are holding up these walls that Jesus went to the cross to tear down. When we segregate, we are working against him. As we say in our, in our wedding ceremonies, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Peter knew this. Right? 
He knew it, but he was living something different. Let me, let me share with you a little bit of Peter's backstory here. See, in Acts 10 and 11, Luke tells us that Peter was, was in the town of Joppa by the Mediterranean uh, Sea when he gets this vision from the Lord. He sees something like a sheet lowered down from heaven, and, and in this sheet are all kinds of, of animals, including birds and reptiles and, and, and wild animals, all these things that the Torah said were forbidden. And there came a voice that said, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Problem. But the the Torah says I can't. This is not what good Jews do. Peter says, No, Lord. I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure or unclean. But the voice from heaven spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. And because Peter's Peter and Peter's stubborn, uh, this happened three times before the sheet and all it contained was pulled back up into heaven. Why do Christians eat bacon? Acts 11. I had a great conversation with a Sikh guy about this this week. But this is about more than just bacon, right? All this was setting Peter up to meet with a man called Cornelius, a Roman, a Gentile, a man who is ready to receive the gospel, who had invited Peter into his home. And so as Peter walks into Cornelius' home, he has this moment where he's talking to his host, but really he's talking more to himself. And he says, you know, it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. See, Peter recognizes that when God has made someone clean, then there's no reason for us to be separated. There's no reason for segregation anymore. In Christ, we are one. And this oneness has to result in real and tangible unity. Not just in heaven, right? See, we all know that together we'll be one in heaven. We'll all be people from all tribes, tongues, and nations will be gathered before the throne. But this is about what we do right now. This is about what we do in our churches and at our dinner tables. So how does Paul respond to the fact that Peter is no longer willing to go into a Gentile's home? He's no longer willing to eat with a a Gentile. See, it's interesting here. He doesn't call Peter out for being a racist. He goes after the problem behind this racist behavior. And the problem for Peter and for everyone who's following his example is that they are not allowing the full implications of the gospel to reach into every area of their lives. Paul says in verse 14, he says, I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message. That's how he characterizes Peter's actions. See, believing the gospel isn't just a matter of saying, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and rose again. Because there are implications to that belief. You have to internalize that truth. Your every attitude, your every action, your every word, your every relationship has to be realigned in light of that fact. That fact that you have been forgiven by God freely by grace alone, and you have been called to his purpose. And so the line of appeal that Paul makes to Peter is basically this. Who you do or do not eat with has to be shaped by what Jesus has done for you. If God didn't forgive you based on your traditions and your culture, why would you exclude people based on your traditions or your culture? See, the gospel has to change how you treat people. And if it doesn't change the, the, these things, then you're not allowing the gospel to reach far enough into your life. This is how 
Paul confronts Peter. Timothy Keller says this, this is the Christian way of opposing someone. When you're trying to motivate people by urging them to see their riches and love in Christ, then you are personally pointing to their value and their dignity as you appeal. But when you try to motivate someone by threatening them, you will probably feel little respect for them as you do so, and they will rightly sense that you are not on their side. But when we use God's grace as a motivator, we can criticize sharply and directly, but the other person will generally be able to perceive that we are nonetheless for them. No wonder Paul was winsome in this situation. So the issue at stake for Peter was segregation. The issue for him was this this tension between Jews and Gentiles. But this, this principle of calling people to live consistently with the gospel applies to every other area of life as well. Take, for example, lying. Okay, One of the commandments, one of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not lie. And so if we breach this commandment, it is a sin. But when Paul gives instructions to the Ephesians about lying, he doesn't couch it in terms of of your guilt before God or being condemned before God. He couches it in terms of, of just living out the gospel. Like, what are the natural implications of the gospel? He says in, in Ephesians 4.25, Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. In other words, Paul is pointing us to the fact that we are one with each other. If we are really one, then what is good for one of us is good for all of us. What is bad for one of us is bad for all of us. And when our personal integrity is compromised, the integrity of all of us is is compromised, right? We are to be messengers of the truth. So tell the truth, not just because lying is a sin, but because you're now part of something bigger than yourself. Stop lying because you are now a messenger of the truth. That's just one example, right, of this principle. Uh, and, okay, that's an easy one. You know, most, even though lying is really popular, most people agree it's bad. So that's the low-hanging fruit. Let's take a look at a more culturally relevant question. What about smoking weed? Some of your pupils are dilating. (laughs) Kidding. So this is now legal in Canada. This is not explicitly mentioned in Scripture. So how do we live consistently with the gospel when it comes to marijuana? Can we have a grown-up conversation about this? Is there anything inherently sinful about this plant? No. God created it. And granted, we've tinkered with the genetics a fair bit. But this plant grows, and and like every plant uh, that God has made, it gives him glory. It's beautiful, and, and there's nothing wrong with it. And, and that goodness can certainly be put to use in our lives for medical purpose. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I give my dog cannabis oil for arthritis and she's a saint. That's a joke. So not a theological statement. Yeah. But what about other uses, right? Well, for what other purpose do people use it? You know, some people have said that, okay, smoking weed is no different than having a glass of wine. Um, But I've never heard anyone say that they enjoy weed for its flavor or its smell. It's possible to drink wine without getting drunk. I don't know if anyone smokes weed to not get high. So what's wrong with getting high? Well, getting high... It compromises our self-control. Self-control keeps us from hurting ourselves. It keeps us from hurting others. Not, not just physically, right? But emotionally, relationally. And given that at every moment 
of our lives. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for the character and the love of God. Self-control is a very important part of keeping us from misrepresenting Jesus to the world. Not only that, self-control is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's how he equips us for the good things that God has prepared in advance for us to do. And so when we willingly give up our self-control to any substance, any addiction, any device maybe, we are working against the Holy Spirit as he is seeking to equip us for the work of the kingdom. So what do we say about about someone who uses marijuana? Same thing Paul says about getting drunk. He says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. See, drunkenness, it robs you of life, but the Spirit fills you with life. Drunkenness robs you of your dignity. The Spirit is, is increasing your dignity because the Spirit is making you like Jesus. Jesus died to give you life and to make you a child of God. That's the gospel, right? So really, what's the controversy here about whether or not it's okay for Christians to get high? Well, if you really understand the gospel, you will know what the Spirit is offering you, and you will know that there are such better things for you to do with your life, for you to do with your time and your money and your body than to be getting high. Don't you see that? Okay, let's, let's do one more issue. Have one more adult conversation. What about, what about sex outside of marriage? See, a lot of people mock Christians because in their mind, Christians think that sex is icky or scary, but nothing could be further from the truth. You know, there's not a single verse in all of Scripture that ever disparages or says anything negative about sex between, in a, between a husband and a wife. Not one. And at the same time, there isn't a single verse of Scripture that speaks approvingly of sex in any other context. In fact, there's this word in the New Testament, pornea, that's the, the, that's the catch-all term for anything else outside of the relationship between husband and a wife. And, it, and everything gets lumped into one basket. It, it's, it's wrong. This isn't for us. Well, why? What's wrong with it? Well, because again, there's an issue with what is consistent with the gospel. The gospel is fundamentally about a God that is good and that always wants our greatest good. Wants to bring us out of the darkness and into light. The Bible describes sex as becoming one flesh, but this, even though it says one flesh, this unity isn't just a physical unity, is it? There's an emotional unity created as well. There's a spiritual unity created. And God's design for this is for this to be something that bonds a husband and wife together for life. It's an expression of complete trust and vulnerability and delight in this union. And it, as part of the whole package of marriage, this, this relationship, this oneness, Paul says in Ephesians 5, this is a symbol of Christ and his church. When husband and wife become one flesh, there is something about that, Paul calls it a mystery, that is representative of, of the unity between Jesus and the people he came to save. When sex happens outside of marriage, it isn't complete trust. It isn't complete commitment. In the case of casual sex, listen, the other person is irrelevant. They are just an object to be used and then disposed of. God didn't make you to be treated this way. He sure didn't make you to treat anyone else that way either. What about the case of a relationship that's developing but isn't marriage yet? Well, it's not complete trust. 
Sex just becomes part of the audition. It becomes a performance in which you have to prove yourself worthy or even worse, where you are evaluating whether or not someone completely giving themselves all that they are is worthy. Trust isn't there. Total acceptance of that person isn't there until you have been united by God for life. See, please understand, the Bible's commands against pornea, they're not there to ruin your life. They're there to give you real intimacy. They're made to give you real closeness that you were made to enjoy. God's will for you really is for your good. And if you truly believe that God is for you, then you can trust him in this area of your life. And maybe today is the right day to have a conversation about a change of direction in your relationships. Maybe today is the right day to have a conversation about living in that trust. Whether we're talking about racism or lying or drugs or sex, the message in all these issues is that God has something better for us. Something better for us than our own sinful ideas. The gospel is good news about a God who loves us and brings us out of darkness and into the light. So the question for us, the question I ask you is, do you believe? Do you believe the gospel? Will you let the gospel reach into every corner of your life and say yes? I will trust you with this. He really can be trusted. I I love um, testimonies. I love it when we get to have people up here to share their testimony, and, and I don't have that this morning. But a friend of ours who was a part of this church last year Uh, named Alina from Finland. She shared some of her testimony on Facebook this week. And I want to read with you what what she wrote because she just really beautifully tells the story of of learning to trust God, letting him come out from the periphery of her life and and be in the center. And um, she also sang a really beautiful song. I don't know if we got that working, Paul. We might? Cool. Okay. If it happens, awesome. If not, check it out online. Uh, We have a link to it on our our Facebook page. This is what she says. How many of you remember Alina? Yeah, some of us, yeah. She said, for four years, I've been so lost with myself and my life. Mostly I've felt fear, self-disrespect, disappointment, failure, and hopelessness. I've been a Christian girl since day one, but now I had lost my purpose in life and my dreams and hopes in God for so long that I had no idea what the heck I was and what I was supposed to do. So my life just went through these past years, and even though my life was messy, I did some great things and met fantastic people and saw cool places that I know have given me unforgettable experiences, but also growth, strength, and bravery. But despite all of those things, I was feeling so empty. I was feeling so numb. I felt like I didn't have anything to give to the people around me, and most importantly, to God. I was so exhausted. I found myself crying my guts out so many times and thinking, what's wrong with me? After these four painful yet instructive years, four months ago, I finally found some peace with myself. One day after talking hours with my dear friend, Nea, she gave me a couple of worship songs that I might like. When I went to bed that night, I started going through that list, and it didn't take long until I found this song that we're going to sing in the video. I don't know exactly what exactly happened, but I listened to it for two and a half hours straight, and I cried like a baby. I was so relieved I felt like God was showing me things I had lost, but he had never forgotten, and what he still saw in me. I am far from where I should be, but it's comforting to know that right now, it's 100% okay for me to be where I am. I realize that if I keep Jesus in the background, I have no idea who I am, because my identity is in him, and I don't want that to be hidden ever again. 
I'm not going to do justice to this next line. She says, oh yeah, boy, I'm so excited about how much more God is going to do in my life. So this is me and this is my God. We'll close by watching this video together and then Karen can come up.